As there were hundreds of fighter planes carving up the skies of World War II, there were also hundreds of bombers, which are combat aircraft designed to take out ground and naval targets with bombs, rockets, torpedoes, and other weaponry. Generally, heavy bombers were designed for long-range strategic bombing, while medium and light bombers were designed for strategic and tactical bombing at shorter ranges. Dive bombers and torpedo bombers were tactical aircraft too, and many planes flew the line between bomber and fighter, receiving modifications which allowed them to engage in air-to-air -air combat as well as drop bombs on ground and naval targets. We listed our top 10 fighter planes in a counterpart video, though in this video we'll be outlining our top 10 bombers of the Second World War from 5 fighting nations. We'll also be revealing what we believe was the all-round best bomber of the Second World War at the end of the video, so stick around. Mitsubishi's G4M medium bomber was Imperial Japan's principal land-based bomber throughout the war and it absolutely menaced the Allies in the early days of the Pacific War, when Japanese Zeros afforded them air superiority. The G4M had an excellent range due to its structural lightness, though this also meant the craft had minimal armor and its crew and fuel tank were vulnerable. Once the Allies caught wind of this, they could put the G4M up in flames with a few well-placed shots, but these flaws were ironed out in the G4M2 and G4M3 variants. The GM42 is recognized as one of the better variants of this craft, and this particular model could carry one massive torpedo, one massive bomb, or 12 small 130 pound or 60 kilo bombs, making it a versatile bomber indeed. Late in the war, some G4Ms were even outfitted to carry Oka human-guided kamikaze craft toward their final destinations. More than 2,400 G4Ms were made throughout the war. Junker's Ju-87 or Stuka was an iconic German dive bomber distinguished by its telltale gull wings and fixed landing gear. Stukas were instrumental in early blitzkriegs, as due to being low altitude dive bombers, they were incredibly accurate and the Germans still had Western Europe on its back foot. The Stuka was, in reality, very vulnerable to fighters and the Allies were able to counter it once they cut through German fighter escorts and gained air superiority. After getting torn apart in the Battle of Britain, the Stuka was withdrawn from Britain, deployed instead to North Africa and in Mediterranean theatres, where it undertook anti-shipping operations. Stukas also had a huge impact in the early days of the Eastern Front as ground support, anti-tank and anti-shipping aircraft. The Stuka, in all its variants, could carry a variety of bombs, though it was also equipped with wing cannons and machine guns, including a flexible canopy-mounted machine gun which was operated by the craft's single gunner. Some 6,000 Stukas were manufactured between 1935 and 1945. Heinkel Flugzeugwerke's HE-111 medium bomber was another distinct German aircraft recognizable by its glass nose and graceful form. And like the Stuka, it was an effective bomber until its weaknesses primarily a weak defensive armament, were exposed in the Battle of Britain, during which it was the backbone of the Luftwaffe's bomber force. The HE-11 could take a bit of a beating, however, and its armaments were eventually improved, with later models boasting a machine gun on the nose, two on the belly, two on the sides, and one in a dorsal position. All in all, it was a pretty versatile craft, capable of delivering all sorts of payloads, and it was employed in most theatres of the war. The HE-111 did become obsolete in 1944, however, and its production ceased in September that year, with more than 6,500 manufactured between 1935 and then. Ilyushin's Il-2 Sturmovik attack bomber is a Soviet classic, and it was absolutely crucial on the Eastern Front, where it provided the Red Army with close support. The Sturmovik bore two forward-firing cannons, two wing machine guns, and a machine gun on the rear of the canopy, which was operated by the gunner, though it could also obliterate ground targets with its underwing fragmentation rockets, of which it could carry eight. The Sturmovik was heavily armored against ground fire, though it was slow and therefore vulnerable to enemy fighters, requiring a fire escort itself. Stalin himself prioritized production on the Sturmovik throughout the war, leading to an insane 36,183 being produced between 1941 
and 1945. The United States boasts some pretty sick aircraft, but the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress has to be the sickest of them all. It wasn't called the Flying Fortress for no reason. This four-engined heavy bomber could take some serious damage and dish out just as much, employing 13 50 caliber machine guns in various positions, including on the tail and carrying up to a 6,000 pound or 2,700 kilo payload. The Flying Fortress was instrumental in the USAAF's daylight strategic bombing campaign, laying waste to German industrial and military targets in occupied Europe. These were big and expensive aircraft, costing around 240,000 USD back in 1945, which is around $2.7 million nowadays. Yet more than 12,700 were manufactured between 1936 and 1945. Easily, the most famous B-17 in existence is the Memphis Belle, to whom we have a whole dedicated video on if you want to check it out. Now, we are dealing with America here, so everything naturally has to be supersized, including the B-17 Flying Fortress, which was basically pushed out of the sky by the B-29 Super Fortress, a four-engine heavy bomber designed for high-altitude bombing and low-altitude nighttime fire bombing. It was the largest bomber to fly in World War II, though it only did so in December 1943, and it wasn't until June 1944 that super fortresses were used to bomb Japan from air bases in China. Showing off the aircraft's exceptional 4,100 mile or 6,600 kilometer range. This flight did have its logistical problems though, so the US military captured the Mariana Islands, putting the infamous B-29 Enola Gay in easy range of its target, Hiroshima, upon which it dropped an atomic bomb. If you thought the B-17 was expensive, hold on to your seat, because the Super Fortress prototype cost almost 4 billion USD, while each of the 3,970 craft manufactured after that cost around 640,000 USD. America. Nothing screams liberty like Consolidated Aircraft's B-24 Liberator, an American heavy bomber which saw heavy use in the war, forming the backbone of the USAAF strategic bomber offensive in the European theater alongside the B-17. This aircraft, however, had a superior range to the B-17, making it an all-round more versatile bomber, and it proved useful in operations in the Pacific, which included bombing Japan as well as in the Battle of the Atlantic, in which Liberators undertook anti-submarine operations, sinking unsuspecting subs when they surfaced for air. More than 18,000 Liberators were made between 1940 and 1945, with Ford Motor Company manufacturing more than 8,600 of them. The Avro Lancaster became Britain's primary heavy bomber after the strategic bombing offensive over Europe, in which the aircraft was a merciless nocturnal predator, targeting German population centers and blowing civilians limb from limb. With an elongated, unobstructed bomb bay, the Lancaster could carry the largest of the RAF's bombs, taking all manner of payload up to the 22,000 pound or 10,000 kilo Grand Slam Earthquake Bomb, the largest carried by any bomber in the war. The Lancaster had exceptional range and it was well defended, boasting 10 Browning 303 caliber machine guns in 4 power operated turrets, armor plating and bulletproof glass. Lancasters were produced in Canada and Australia as well, with a total of 7,377 being made between 1941 and 1947. The DE Havilland DH-98 Mosquito was a British multi-role combat aircraft, though it was initially conceived as an unarmed fast bomber, and it's just awesome, so it's worthy of our list. Across all its different versions, the Mosquito could be utilized as a fighter bomber, a day or night fighter, a nocturnal ground attack intruder, almost like the insect after which it was named, a light bomber, a recon craft, a transport craft, and for much more. The B Mark 16, one of its bomber variants, could carry a 4,000 pound or 1,800 kilo blockbuster bomb or cookie in its internal bomb bay, and only certain variants of the craft actually wielded defensive armaments such as guns and rockets, as guns and turrets compromised the Mosquito's streamlining, detracting from its speed and maneuverability, 
which were what gave the aircraft its edge. Now, we finished our best fighter plane list with Ketamine ET's Flying Saucer, so it's only right we finished this one with a bang as well, a model aircraft gone wrong. The Miles M39B Libelula honestly looks like someone drank 16 pints, threw out the instruction manual and built the damn plane anyway. It honestly hurts my eyes just looking at it and I'm glad only one of these flying shoe anvils was ever produced. Rest easy knowing that this abomination was disassembled. I like to think that, instead of recycling the parts, they threw them into the fires of Mount Doom. Jokes aside, it's a little difficult to decide which of these bombers was the very best, as light, medium and heavy bombers filled different roles, and bombers in general were designed to decimate ground targets rather than each other. But in this one, we're going with the Stuka dive bomber. It was a durable, reliable craft which rained precision hell upon its targets, and its contribution to early Blitzkrieg victories, German propaganda and allied fear cannot be understated. But what do you think? Was the Stuka more an instrument of propaganda and fear rather than an effective aircraft? Did we include any bombers on our top 10 list that you wouldn't have included in yours? If so, which bombers would you have included? Let us know all of that in the comment section below. And as per usual guys, just before you run off, make sure you check out the description links below if you want to join a wider history community on our Discord, Facebook, and Instagram. To each of these, we post exclusive content to them. So if you want to check out some cool posts on Instagram and Facebook or interact with me on the Discord, make sure you check all those out. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new. Hope you learned something new. Hope you